Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Activities for People Living with Dementia. We're proud to offer this series with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and the United Way of Tarrant County. Some of our programs are recorded and some are made available for viewing through a YouTube channel for future use. To find us on YouTube, type in Dementia Friendly Fort Worth, click on our logo and choose videos. I am Martha Brown, your host for today's activities. <coughs> Today, the Amon Carter Museum of American Art brings us Peggy Spear, who is going to take from their collection um, art from landscape and show us what she thinks about landscape today. It's always unusual and interesting. Peggy, take it away. All right. So Peggy, we know that the, we know that you guys have a lot of landscape paintings in color. So we do. See and I, of course, picked only black and white ones. And I, <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, I forced myself to go back in and put some color ones in. So oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what is going on. Okay. Landscape. Half of it is color, Peggy. Yeah, I know. And <laughs> you'd think this would be the one of the more colorful ones we'd ever do, but yeah. don't worry. I humbled us all with the black and the white. I love it. Oh, nice. Oh. Oh, okay. Really absorb this one in, guys, because this is as bright as we're going to get today. Okay. So this is a obviously a landscape. It's an oil on painting, an oil on canvas painting entitled "Cliffs of Green River." So I heard some reactions. What 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 struck struck you the first time you saw it? The colors. As if there's a sunrise on the mountains. Well, and, and the whole the whole scope, uh, pan mm -hmm. the panorama of it. Yeah. yeah. Majesty. Yeah. Yeah, it feels very majestic. The um, dimensions are twenty five by forty five, so it's it's sizable. Ooh, twenty five by twenty five. Oh, okay. This is but it doesn't look as if it's a quadrant. Twenty five by forty five. Oh, by 45. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, it's not a square. No, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, it, it's in a landscape orientation and um, it's currently on view. This one is typically on view a lot. We don't loan it out um, often. So it was gone for a little bit, but he's back. Is this an actual place? Yes, in Wyoming, I believe. The wow. Green River, Wyoming. Green River, sure. Wyoming. Say that again, Steve. It's in Wyoming, Green yeah. River, Wyoming. Yeah, so um, Thomas Moran, I'm sure you've heard of Tom. We've looked at artwork from Thomas Moran before, but typically when you think of landscape in art history, Thomas Moran is one of those people along with Bierstadt that you think of when you think of landscape. And so, um, at least American landscape. So uh, Moran was a uh, commissioned to work on a geographical, a geological survey that was taking place in 1871. And he was living on the East Coast at the time, I want to say Philly, maybe. And he took a train out to Wyoming to meet up with the rest of the, um, the expedition. And he, the train took him to this Green River area. And when he got there, he was absolutely fascinated with what he mm -hmm. saw, particularly mm -hmm. with these buttes that you can see that I think a lot of you probably that's what you might have noticed first is just the the tall buttes with the sun on them. Mm -hmm. And so this was not what he was going to document. And this was not the point of his trip, but this was one of the first things he started drawing, painting when he because he was a drawer. Um, when he when he got there before he met up with the rest of the, the rest of the expedition that was there to really map out um, Yellowstone, what would eventually be Yellowstone National Park. And so um, the drawings that he did from that expedition were really important in the congressional uh, presentation on deciding whether or not to make this the first Yellowstone, the first national park. So Moran was very instrumental in helping that, but we're not talking about <coughs> Yellowstone, we're talking about <coughs> Green River. So by the time he had gotten to Green River, he took the train in 
And he was often commissioned by Santa Fe, the uh, train company to kind of like Remington to draw scenes of the West. So he was often, you know, he was on the train, he was out West quite a bit. Uh, but we don't see anything that looks like train, a crossroads for trains here, do we? Just no. humans. We see humans. horses. Humans and horses. I, I think the train is, was quite a ways from this area. So it wasn't, he didn't get off the train and see it. It, it wasn't the, far. It, no, it wasn't, wasn't far. far. It wasn't right on the water, but it wasn't right. far. So right. This whole yeah. area, you would have seen some sort of train track at some point. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's not what he's depicting. He deliberately removed any sort of, oh. of, um, modern life from what is what would have actually been there because this was like a major this area in wyoming was a, a crossroads for a lot of railroad stations but we don't see any of that i mean you might have seen maybe a trail a train barreling back here or steam coming or even tracks or wires yeah. or things like that we're not seeing any of that he deliberately removed all of that and focused on the untouched land that even he didn't see, but he imagined it would have been. Mm -hmm. And so um, particularly, again, for audiences that were back east who would never have made it out west, there was a real appeal for these type of, of Western nostalgic scenes. And um, this subject of his, the of Green River and the cliffs, he painted over 40 in about 30, I mean, painted over 40 canvases in about 30 years of mm -hmm. this particular scene. So this was something that just continually inspired him. He was continually interested in. And no one of the, the artworks is the same. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. so, so Peggy, mm -hmm. I, I, I think we saw, Myra and I saw another one of his paintings on the Green River on uh, some, uh, but it showed us that said mountains. They had a hunter off on one side of the river and mm -hmm. then some, some settlers or something on the other side of the river. Yeah, so. very easily you could have, because I mean, there's so many of them and a lot of museum collections have them. Yep. Um, they're pretty <sighs> iconic in his, his history of art. Um, but he would, it might have felt, the mood might have felt different in the one that you'd seen if it were from a similar vantage point. Right, it could be. I, I, we don't, I don't remember. It was right, but you're also talking about settlers. Like we, I can't tell... I don't think these are American Indians and some of them he might have included American Indians. Okay. Um, the time of day could be different, even if it's from the same vantage points, but there was no duplicate. So he really worked with condition and mood to create okay. different, different um, landscapes, but of the same topic over and over and over <laughs> again. And so the, um, the Union Pacific, not Santa Fe, Union Pacific was the train um, company that he often collaborated with. And so anyway, the the buttes were really, or the cliffs were really what um, lured him in. And so you can They're see these like colors. Hmm? Those are art stuff. Uh oh. Let me put them on mute. Yeah, if you want. Okay. Um, do we like this type of landscape? It's a pretty traditional landscape. Yes, I yes. love this. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the the expedition he was meeting up with was a man, Hayden, that was leading the expedition. And he ended up naming one of the three largest Tet mountains in the Tetons after Moran. So Mount Moran exists in really? the Tetons. Yeah, as a as a nod to Thomas Moran for all of his contributions to getting Yellowstone um, turned into a national park. Hmm. So- It's amazing how much history you're teaching us, Peggy. That's right, I love it. Well, yeah, I mean, this was, a, with the, with these expeditions, <laughs> they're beautiful artworks, but it was not necessarily made to be the artwork. It was like, because they didn't have cameras they could easily carry around or things like that. It was really meant to kind of document what back for back east so it's so entrenched in history not just art history 
So um, we have got one more Moran. We're starting to lose our color <laughs> <laughs> in our um, these beautiful sketches and, and watercolors. And I want to say maybe a year ago now, this was actually on view. And since it was on view as a watercolor, it will rest for a very long time afterwards. But this is another um, example of a Thomas Moran painting. How does it feel different than the last one? Uh, well, it's uh, it's very much more rugged. There's no really anything, any, any people. The, no people. Like any civilization could get to this place. Yeah, there's absolutely no people. You're right. And 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 no wow moment for me. It's, yeah. it's not vibrant. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> No, it's not. And part of it is the medium he's working in. He's using watercolor. We're here, he's using oil on canvas. Yeah. Here we've got watercolor on paper and some pencil. You might be able to see the pencil lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here, yeah. down here. It has a hurried feel to it as if he were might've been sitting on one of these, uh, you know, a, a saddleback or something like that looking off, but he's, he probably was back in studio or at a camp when he was drawing this. So there's a there's a little. It's not as hurried as it looks. Okay. Too bad but he didn't put any. Oh, go ahead. Uh, it's too bad he didn't put any green on. It looks like a bush he had penciled in <laughs> there. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I, you know, I, I've been to Pikes Peak, and there's not a whole lot of green on Pikes Peak. No, but that it looks like it, Don. <laughs> that it could be a bush. And I think that cog train would, because have you taken that cog train, John, up Pikes Peak? Yes, I have. Yeah. I'm not sure when that was yeah. built. Oh, but, yes, yes, yes. But there would have been, there probably would have been more people, not totally a lot of people, maybe not at this altitude, but there was, there were people going up and down Pikes Peak. So there was, again, we, we've removed any sort of, um, any sort of human touch that people went yeah. We're definitely on yeah. the Pikes Peak. More abstract. Um, we okay. So this was painted in '74. This was painted in 1901. Painted that's in like, that's So like later three. in his career, he got he got less interested in the. This was a common style of his. He was very. He would draw a lot. Only include the details that jumped out to him. So like yet, are you saying you're kind of missing the wow factor? The wow factor for Moran was the snowy Pikes Peak that was off yeah. in the distance. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. why it's colored in. Other than that, he wasn't as interested in some of the details that he included. So it wasn't okay. important for him at this, as he started simplifying his style to include the colors the way he once had earlier in his career. So a lot, yeah. of, a lot of drawings from this, drawings and watercolors from this time in his life look very similar to this in terms of the muted palette, unfinished graphite drawings just added. But it's still, I mean, it's not, it's not this at all, but it's still beautiful. Better mm -hmm. than I could ever draw, let's just put it that way. <laughs> all right, well now we're getting, here's Pike's Peak, but without color. <laughs> So have any, I know it sounded like Donna Myra have been, have any of you also been to Pikes Peak in Colorado? Nope. Martha, you have? Martha has. Cool. So it's about, man, it's probably only 30 minutes south of the Air Force Academy. Um, yes. About a 90 minutes south of Denver. It's in that part of the state. Near the Garden of the Gods. Um, yep. Area. Yeah, the whole area is, is stunning. The Broadmoor Hotel is there. It's, it's a beautiful part of Colorado. Um, but Pikes Peak has been a fascinating subject for so many artists, whether it's their cartographers or on a geological expedition or just landscape artists in and of themselves, photographers. So here, this was another result of um, of an expedition that was happening. Charles Pruess was, um, Pre Pruess maybe is how you say it. He's Christ. a German artist. He, um, he immigrated from Germany to the United States and then joined John C. Fremont on five expeditions out West. And so this is just one of 
hundreds of drawings and that came from this. Um, but but he was he, so he was a map maker, a cartographer, and then a landscape drawer surveyor. And so um, it's it's very different again from Pike's Peak we're seeing here. Right. But he's still able to capture that snowy pea. Yes. Mm -hmm. And here you really don't see any sort of indication of people at all. So, so Myra and I were just talking about how this is very, very realistic in the fact that when you're driving into Colorado, you, you see flat, 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 and all of a sudden mm -hmm. the mountains just pop up from the flat. It's so true. It's so true, especially coming from that side of the state. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, <coughs> if they come out of nowhere. But yeah. You're, it, he, this is very accurate in that depiction. Yeah, this feels more scientific than, uh, I mean, this was not part of a survey, but this feels pretty scientific. It doesn't feel like it, it was, it meant, it feels as if it's conveying information versus just showing the beautiful vistas of Colorado. Yeah. The detail that a map maker must use is indicated by the uh, foreground and the small trees. They look like they're made by a map maker. You think so? I do. Yeah. Yeah, lots of detail. Lots of detail that give you good pers uh, perspective. Yes. Um, help place you where you are. I mean, it's, and even the sky feels moody for it just being a map. He is yeah. able to kind of, to give you a full scene and not just here is summit, the summit of Pikes Peak or whatever. And again, the measurement at the bottom, 40 miles distant from camp. So you were able to probably figure out coordinates if we needed to, things like that. Um, so this, I think this is from an 1843 expedition and then it was completed after the fact. So he wasn't necessarily working on the fly. They were able to kind of camp and then go out and come back in and things like that. Um, and then it was printed in Baltimore. So they came back East, everything was printed back on the East Coast. And um, he also was responsible for, this artist was responsible for depicting the Oregon Trail. Mm -hmm. He created the map of what that path looked like and that was deemed the Oregon Trail map. So he um, was very respected in terms of what his capability was for depicting the American West back east so it's a little we have a lot a lot of maps like this in our collection that were were used for um expedition or geological survey things like that geographical geological all of it oh, this is fun. black and white but i feel like this is <clears throat> such a a wonderful landscape that i didn't it didn't faze me this almost looks like escher <laughs> what what gives you that feel? Uh, the stump in the front. Oh, the stump. Okay. It looks like it's been melted. Oh yeah, I can see what you're saying, Matt. Uh huh. What else do people notice about this landscape? Oh, snow. Snow. Did you if, mm -hmm. if if you didn't see the title at the bottom, would you have known it was snow or would it have just felt? Oh no, I, I thought it was snow when I saw it. You did, okay. Yeah, the way way the white goes down the the, the creek snow. there. Yep. And and the heaviness of the sky feels like it just snowed. I don't, you know that mm. gray, cold, close to the earth feeling the sky oh, has yeah. right mm -hmm. after snow. Oh gosh, I bet you guys do in Kansas, you know exactly that feeling. That it just, there's a lot of, uh, you can feel a lot of the cold or the other stillness in this lithograph, I feel, um, for, it only, for not having any color. You can, you know what that landscape might feel like. So this particular artist, we've looked at some of her artworks in the past, but she, um, in the 30s, she wrote the book, Millions of Cats, wrote and illustrated that book, Millions of Cats, if you've ever heard of it. But um, it's a child, a children's book that won her awards when she created it. But she, during the 30s and 40s, she was really focusing on landscapes and still lives. And that's um, 
the more she created, the more recognition she started getting in her uh, in her career while she was alive. And so she was working, I believe, out in New York. Um, she came from Minneapolis. Her dad was, her parents were from Germany. They were a painter and a photographer. So at a young age, she had a very artistic eye and then uh, moved from Minneapolis to New York and started taking classes with some other artists we've looked at in the past. Um, so she was in good, in good tutelage and was able then to make a name for herself. It feels cold. Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. It does feel cool. And the size of this is nine by 12. Nine by 12, okay. When I first saw it, I thought it was gonna be something kind of small, like a three by five, but um, it's it's got a good presence. Uh, you know, I kind of like the way she draws her trees with the uh, with the trunks and limbs bare and just little leaves on the top of them. Mm -hmm. Branches. Branches. Yeah, the, the trees seem to mimic the landscape. Yes, yes, the rounded uh, rounded hills in the background. Yeah, exactly right. It looks right, pretty feminine. It does, it does. And she um, was one of the few female artists of the day, print artists um, of the day that was a name people knew. So she... It might have been deliberate. I mean, this is her style, but it might have been deliberate that she had a little bit of a different take on her print because she was female versus male. Cool. Okay. All right, we've got, I think, one more. All right. Ooh, wow. Okay, well. Um, I see, this I is see, a really I, powerful I I photograph. This is. Yes, it is. This looks There's like no uh, land. Oh, I, 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 before I read the title, I knew it was a flood uh, mm -hmm. and then a river because that's water all around it and the, the house and the trees and the barn and stuff. Yeah. If you grew up in the Midwest or near a river that would overflow, you might have lived through something like this. You would definitely recognize from the news. And just with everything that had been going on with uh, Hurricane Ian in the last couple of weeks and yeah. the recovery of that, mm -hmm. this is um a depiction of a natural disaster that you know this is land you know this is a landscape we see houses and trees but we don't see any land it's pretty wild mm -hmm. what an interesting choice yeah I, I went back and forth on this but it's it was in our land in our landscape category. So I thought, yeah, I mean, this is, a, I don't know what else you would categorize it as. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yet you see a boat That's on right. the land. Yeah. That's right. There yeah. you go. I'm going to go, folks. I got another All call. Right. Bye, I'll Steve. See you very much. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, Steve. Bye. Yeah, and I thought so they this. had flood before, or they were close to the river where they could use the boat. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Uh, what I see is a, a boat that's there, maybe to help get people yeah, out of you. to get people out of the, the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. Yes, or to get things out of the farmhouse because it doesn't look like the farmhouse is totally washed away. But uh, no, no, you're right. They but were there's built no just... sense of like where is the water coming from? Where right. is it going to? It's it's very surreal feeling you don't yeah. there's no point of reference in terms of like that's right that down. Mm -hmm. in fact this looks like an aerial picture i guess it is, you're right it is mm -hmm. good observation don and so this um particular photographer um did a lot of photojournalism so it's not meant to necessarily be a beautiful photograph but it is a beautiful photograph. It is yeah. beautiful. Um, it was yeah. really meant to document what was happening to the area during the flood. <coughs> and so he worked for the um, Farm, what is it, Farm Security Act during the Depression, um, photographing rural and small town America. So this was probably a subject he'd photograph time and again. Um, and then he yeah. worked for the government. And he was working with for a while with Roy Stryker, who was, we've seen a lot of projects Roy Stryker commissioned out of New Jersey, in New York. He was, um, gave a lot of photographers projects, um, 
some with the FSA and then through other things he worked on the standard, I believe he was with the, like, what is it, Standard Oil, the New Jersey Standard Oil Company. So um, Arthur is just another one of those photographers in that stable of photograph photographers who um, were documenting America during a, a sad time in America. Well, the thing, you, the tragedy I don't think you really see in this is that all every place where there's water around there, probably was growing crops and, mm -hmm. uh, and the crops are gone. Mm -hmm. What it, I didn't even enter my mind. You're right, Don. That's exactly right. And the crops that they previously had were in the barn mm -hmm. that's completely submerged. Yep. Yep. So mm -hmm. whatever they had, any yeah. income they had is uh, post income and new income is gone. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. Yeah. Any livestock or anything to help uh, keep livestock? Them? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Man, and thinking about that even makes it more powerful of a photograph. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. yeah. The implication that the things we don't see, and that's that's a lot in art sometimes. The things we don't see are just as important as the things we do see. I really that like is, this. I, oh, I really like this too, man. I really like this. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it has a sense of that timelessness. I mean, we're still seeing photographs like this. Mm-hmm. Today. On our new right. So, you know, while things might be happening because of global warming and things like that at a more frequent rate, we're still this was still something people were living with, coping with, dealing with, um since settling in the United. I mean, yeah. the American Indians probably were dealing with these same things in these areas. So no one's always you know, they might not have rooted down near a riverbed area, but, you know, this is something that is just part of living on the land. I have a friend who lives in St. Louis, and in, in my memory, I remember three floods that she's lived through. Mm. Oh, really? At my age of 72. Wow. And we weren't born in 43, so this, this <laughs> is very... So not, you don't know this one, right? <laughs> no, no, uh -uh, don't know this one, but you can tell with the levees, I lived on the Mississippi for a little while and there was a huge uh, river wall at the end of the yeah. downward street. Yeah. Probably is an answer to what kept happening. Right, right. Yeah. And, and you know, even with all the levees that they have now, they're still flooding like right. this. It wipes out. People yeah. still have to think, I, I have to, I'm, I'm, running, I'm, running, I'm running a farm. I have to live in the middle of this floodplain in order to be efficient with the, uh, um, managing my farm and cattle and crops. Right. Right, because some of them don't even, some of these people don't even have an alternative. Like, can't go just buy new land or oh. I can't uproot. This has been in my family for however many years. I can't just uproot this farm or, you know, whatever. So it's like, yeah, you take the good with the bad, the real bad. Mm -hmm. So those are our landscapes for this week. All right. Yay, Peggy. We Thank will you. be looking at ghosts next ghosts. week. Ghosts. 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 We're really gearing up for Halloween. So oh, G O G H O S T. Uh -huh. All right. Ghosts. And then the following week is cemeteries. We have a lot All right. of cemeteries. Ooh. So we're getting spooky over here at the Carter Gang. <laughs> All right, y'all have a good week, and I will see Thanks. you next Wednesday. You. Thank you, Miss Peggy. Have a Bye. wonderful day. Bye. All right, bye. Bye-bye.